Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, for those who are perhaps not familiar with, uh, with the society, I should introduce myself. I'm Tony Stockwell, currently president. And I warmly welcome all those who may be visiting the society for the first time, albeit virtually. Now this evening, we are celebrating the launch of Ian Talbot's History of British Diplomacy in Post-Colonial Pakistan. Ian is Professor in the History of Modern South Asia at the University of Southampton and an authority on the history of the colonial Punjab. He's also a member of the Society's Council. Ian's oeuvre includes no less than 10 monographs. Punjab and the Raj was published at the end of 2020. Hard on its heels comes the history of British diplomacy in post-colonial Pakistan, which is being launched this evening and which our discussants will debate. This book examines the ways in which Britain's previous role in South Asia, its imperial role, may have assisted or may have impeded the post-colonial relationship between Britain and Pakistan. Now some housekeeping. To begin proceedings, I'd like to invite Ian to introduce his thesis and then to open up discussion with Dr. Rakesh Ankit from Loughborough University and Professor Roger Long from Eastern Michigan University. And from there on, provided time permits, to consider a selection of questions and comments from which I gather is a large audience. Now some housekeeping. There is a chat function at the bottom of the screen, and this will enable participants to put forward to um, uh, Dr. Uh, um, to, to, uh, to, to our curator um, questions and comments from which uh, we shall be able to choose at least a few before time runs out on us. The um, evening will be uh, recorded uh, on the RAS uh, YouTube uh, account, and so will be available after the event. The um, book itself is available from the Society, uh, particularly for the Society this evening, and as I understand it, a 20% discount. I think that's right, isn't it, uh, um, Matty? That's correct. Yes, that's correct. So perhaps to get underway then, um, Ian, would you like to introduce the book? Yes, thank, thank you very much, uh, Tony, for that introduction. Uh, and um, certainly, uh, well, I'll speak quite briefly, actually, and, and just bring out some of the themes. I'm going to start off, though, uh, just by saying a word about how I came to write this. I think that's always a useful beginning. Um, obviously, I'm not a diplomatic historian, uh, but I am a historian uh, of uh, South Asia and I was concerned when I uh, was looking at uh, this particular topic that it might be an opportunity to bring a historian's eye into um, diplomatic history from the perspective which has already been raised of how was Britain's ability to fulfill its diplomatic interest in Pakistan served by its colonial past and what might have been the ways in which uh, it could be hindered uh, by that past. So that really was the starting point uh, for uh, the volume. Uh, and in this volume, uh, what I do is I, I look at some of the long-term influences uh, and, and some of the interests which Britain had uh, in, in Pakistan. Uh, things like uh, security interests, commercial interest, uh, the growing interest uh, arising from 
uh, the Pakistani British population, uh, which was growing over the decades, and, and which of course uh, is, is a feature very much uh, of the contemporary uh, activities uh, of the High Commission in terms of what is sometimes called diasporic diplomacy, certainly in consular activities. Uh, it's a, it was an interesting point that um, when Hilary Sinnott arrived in Islamabad as High Commissioner in the spring of 2000, he discovered the mission was the single biggest British immigration outfit in the world in, the t in terms of the numbers of applications. So that's a, a new development uh, which has come alongside a longer term uh, interest that Britain has had in, in the Pakistan region. Uh, but of course those interests are also linked with Britain's interest with India. And this is where uh, you could say that sometimes Britain has, has uh, found it difficult to balance its interest in India uh, with its interest uh, in Pakistan, so that it may on occasion please neither country, uh, particularly of course uh, when it comes down to addressing issues uh, which are very controversial in the relationship between India and Pakistan. I'm thinking of the Kashmir issue, of course. Um, so, so Britain has to do a balancing act, uh, and, and sometimes this has certainly disappointed people in Pakistan who were hoping uh, for, I think, uh, much more British assistance in resolving this issue uh, than uh, has been forthcoming, uh, particularly uh, at times of conflict. The volume's analysis is framed chronologically uh, by the careers of key holders of the roles of uh, High Commissioner, that's head of the diplomatic mission, and Deputy High Commissioner, uh, which could be um, someone who was working uh, in what are called the outposts uh, of the High Commission. Uh, the Deputy High Commissions in uh, places like Lahore, Karachi, of course, after the move from Karachi, where the main headquarters was, up to Rawalpindi, and then eventually uh, to Islamabad in 1971. The roles, of course, of High Commissioner and Deputy High Commissioner uh, are, are part of um, the sort of uh, legacy of the diplomatic system which emerged in the 1880s as colonies were transformed uh, into dominions uh, of the British Empire. Um, and for most of the, the post-colonial period, um, the British have been running a high commission uh, in uh, Pakistan. There, there was a 17-year gap uh, in which uh, Pakistan was outside the Commonwealth. And then the, the, the diplomatic mission was organized around an embassy and, and consulates. But of course, it's not just the, um, the organization uh, of, of the institutions and the role of particular holders of these titles of High Commissioner and Deputy High Commissioner, uh, which frame any attempt to understand uh, the role uh, of the High Commission, but also, of course, this is intersected by developments in Pakistan's history and in its uh, regional relations. These intersect. Uh, with um, the careers of uh, these heads of mission. And of course, there are a number of key moments that we could point to. The aftermath of partition, the enduring rivalry with India, focused on the Kashmir dispute, um, the growing sway of the United States in the context of South Asia's importance in the Cold War, uh, the breakup of Pakistan, of course, in 1971, uh, and the freeze in Britain's relationships with Pakistan following its exit from the Commonwealth, which was a response to uh, th that event. Pakistan's emergence as a frontline state uh, in the wake of the Soviet occupation of Afghanistan in 1979, and of course uh, also after 9-11. Um, alongside this chronological framework, the British diplomatic mission's activities uh, are also framed uh, in terms of Article 3 of the 1961 Vienna Convention uh, on Diplomatic Relations. This lays down a resident mission's fourfold role, uh, which is to protect its country's interests and nationals, 
uh, within the limits permitted by international law, negotiate with the receiving state, ascertain conditions within it, and report home, and promote friendly relations, and develop economic, cultural, and scientific relations. Now, the relative importance of these roles has fluctuated uh, over the seven decades. Although reporting and representing uh, Britain's interest in terms of public diplomacy uh, have been constant activities. In terms of reporting, I think it's also interesting to say that, uh, of course, it's the reports from the headquarters and the outposts which um, help uh, inform historians' narratives uh, of Pakistan's post-colonial history. Uh, they owe much to this reporting role, and indeed I've used uh, these reports uh, in some of my works on uh, Pakistan's post-colonial political history. The aim wasn't in this book, of course, to, to repeat that material, but to look more at uh, how these appreciations were produced, uh, how they were refined and transmitted uh, to London, and, and perhaps how they influence policy formulation uh, in London. The history of the, uh, the mission mirrors Pakistan history in many ways, with an improvised beginning amidst the chaos of partition, um, followed by a temporary move to Ralpindi uh, in the 1960s, uh, which of course was part of the shifting of power decisively to the military, uh, because of course Ralpindi was where the, the military headquarters uh, were based. And then finally, uh, in the uh, early years of the 21st century, operation in a very securitized uh, Islamabad setting uh, post 9-11. Now little has been written ab ab about either these uh, moves uh, or about how the High Commission operated uh, and how particular uh, heads of mission may have influenced um, the policy brief uh, that they were given from London uh, in terms of, of Britain's uh, interests. Of course, it helped Britain at the outset uh, that many of the diplomats uh, possessed years of colonial experience. Um, and indeed, that experience gave them uh, perhaps greater depth of knowledge uh, about Pakistan's society and its politics and diplomats from other countries. Uh, Alexander Simon, Britain's High Commissioner from 1954 to 61, uh, during a visit to the staff college at Quetta, uh, was able to impress the commandant uh, by providing an anecdote about most of the officers whose names were commemorated on the graduation board. Uh, some of the deputy high commissioners uh, had worked either for the ICS or uh, in the political services uh, and brought uh, in-depth knowledge of areas such as the, uh, the, the frontier region uh, with them uh, when they took up their roles uh, after uh, independence. Yet these roles were sometimes carried out in uh, very sort of ad hoc conditions, which as I said earlier, mirrors uh, the fact that Pakistan state itself had to more or less establish uh, governance uh, from scratch. Uh, it wasn't uh, the inheritor of the Raj in the way that uh, India uh, was. Uh, so that um, the High Commission in Karachi uh, in the early years was a building leased from the British Chamber of Commerce uh, and it uh, didn't have the security uh, that uh, you would expect uh, in a High Commission because part of the building was also occupied by Pakistan uh, Telegraph uh, office, so that uh, there, there were uh, issues there. The, the deputy high commissions in Ralpindi and Peshawar, uh, which provided vantage points on the Pakistan army and the tribal areas, actually commenced their operations in hotels, Flashman's Hotel and Dean's Hotel. Uh, 
and indeed uh, the first um, Deputy High Commissioner in Ralpinder, Alexander Reed, uh, had to in, uh, operate the, the office in very cramped conditions in room number 25 uh, in uh, Flashman's Hotel. And he was a familiar figure uh, in uh, Ralpindi, riding a bicycle, wearing a tweed hat as he traveled each morning to GHQ. Uh, my task, he was to later recall, was to gain the confidence of the senior officers and from them to obtain as clear as possible a picture of what was happening in Kashmir. Interspersed with details of troop dispositions, he made often very wry comments uh, about British social life uh, uh, in, in Ralpindi and, and particularly about uh, issues like um, prohibition. Reed's counterpart in Dhaka, uh, the redoubtable Leonard Cope Wallace, who'd first been posted to Bengal in 1924. Um, often traveled to Calcutta after independence, uh, sometimes every two or three months, and stayed privately in the Bengal club, uh, where he uh, met British businessmen who had interest in East Bengal and also met the British Deputy High Commissioner uh, in Calcutta and his secretaries. And uh, he justified these uh, contacts because he said they reduced the possibility of the Commonwealth Relations Office receiving conflicting appreciations uh, from its uh, High Commissions and Deputy High Commissions. Uh, and this two-way uh, intercommunication between Dhaka and Calcutta uh, was deepened when Cope Wallace proposed an exchange of fortnightly reports uh, on the understanding they would not be passed uh, to their respective headquarters. So you can see how these informal connections going back to um, the colonial era are, are very much uh, impacting on uh, the practice of British diplomacy. And this wasn't, of course, just at the uh, level of the deputy high commissions. Uh, a number of the heads of mission uh, had long-term uh, old India uh, sort of careers. Uh, Sir Gilbert Lathwaite, the second High Commissioner in Karachi, uh, was one uh, such example uh, who had um, decades of experience uh, in, in India. Uh, Lathwaite um, was very popular with the British resident community uh, and was certainly engaged in what we might now call um, in the modern era economic diplomacy. Uh, he was ever seeking opportunities for British business especially in Karachi, but also in Chittagong. And when he departed for home to become the permanent undersecretary of state uh, for Commonwealth relations, that gives you some idea of his uh, standing. Uh, the British residents uh, dispatched a flotilla of the Karachi Yacht Club uh, to accompany him to the harbour mouth. Uh, so Lathwaite is one, one of these people who sort of straddles uh, it, the, the colonial and the, um, the post-colonial era. Another feature uh, of British diplomacy, which of course is different to that of other countries, is that um, certainly in comparison, say, with the United States, um, the British moved people around uh, from India uh, to Pakistan and back again. Uh, some uh, high commissioners served as deputy high commissioners in one country before going to the next or uh, moved uh, between uh, more junior postings before becoming a uh, high commissioner. Uh, so that this awareness of what's happening both sides of the border uh, continues um, well beyond uh, the impact of, of partition. And at certain moments, it could be decisive. Um, Lathwaite's deputy in Karachi, Morris James, uh, who moved between posts uh, in India and Pakistan, uh, and I think at least three occasions, um, was able to utilize the contacts he possessed in New Delhi uh, when he was uh, serving in Pakistan to help defuse the Rana of Kutch crisis uh, in 1965. 
James had also um, used his contacts in what were ultimately abortive efforts to help um, the resolution of the Kashmir dispute, uh, which both Britain and the United States were really working hard to achieve in 1962-3 uh, in the wake of the, um, the Sino-Indian War, which both gave them more leverage over India, but also raised the threat as they saw it of communism. Uh, from China uh, in the subcontinent and the need for the two countries to um, resolve their differences. Uh, James interacted both with uh, high-ranking Indians but also uh, with uh, Paul Gore Booth, the British High Commissioner in Delhi. He flew over uh, to compare notes with him uh, before the talks commenced to make sure uh, that the, the two High Commissions were on the same page as far as this was concerned. Uh, James also worked very closely with his American counterpart in Pakistan uh, to try and keep this dialogue going uh, as it increasingly stumbled through six rounds uh, of negotiations before uh, its ultimate failure. Now this level of working relationship between British and American diplomats is not um, confined uh, to the 1960s uh, but is very much uh, present if you trace the, the history uh, of the diplomatic mission up to certainly uh, the early years of, of this century. And indeed it's a theme uh, which runs through, a sub-theme which runs through a number of the chapters uh, of the volume. Surprisingly few accounts of the, the, the quote special relationship have examined how this works at the level of field diplomacy. Uh, the emphasis has tended to be on summitry and the relationship between presidents uh, and uh, prime ministers. However, certainly from the Pakistan experience, uh, ground level pooling of knowledge uh, and enforcement of diplomatic missions uh, has been an asset uh, for both countries as they pursued of course um, their own separate national interest uh, but th these on numerous occasions uh, are uh, shared uh, interests not always sometimes they're in competition uh, but a bit often uh, they, they are shared uh, interests another theme of, of the the volume is the way in which um, certainly since uh, the 21st century, um, the digital diplomacy has shifted skill sets and demands. However, uh, in some respects, they've reinforced the traditional strengths of the British presence uh, in uh, Pakistan. Uh, certainly the reach of public diplomacy uh, has, has been extended and this has reinforced the potential of the soft power appeal uh, of the English language and culture uh, to Pakistanis. Uh, also, advances in communications have enabled uh, diplomats based in Pakistan uh, to feed more frequently into policy formulation uh, in London uh, than perhaps uh, they sometimes did in the past. Um, Another change, of course, in the 20th century uh, uh, for the work of the High Commission, as I've already uh, referred, is, is that there is now a very large um, mass air travel, or there has been into the last year, uh, between Britain uh, and Pakistan, uh, involving uh, up to about 1.5 million uh, visits of, of either Pakistanis or British Pakistanis. Um, this, of course, was uh, a major uh, issue uh, for the High Commission. Uh, Senate uh, recorded that uh, on some days there were up to 4,000 people queuing outside of the, uh, the High Commission uh, as a result of this uh, traffic. Uh, of course, um, the visa activities were shifted uh, to Abu Dhabi, uh, the ship was going to happen anyway, uh, but uh, it was uh, rapidly expanded in the wake of the, the bombing of the Islamabad Marriott Hotel in 2008. 
uh, and a, a, what is known as a, a sort of hub and a spoke system uh, of um, consular activity uh, regarding visas was established. Again, that was something which uh, there's been very little written about. Uh, also, of course, the um, the travel between the two countries has has raised other issues uh, which have con concerned the consular activities uh, of the uh, High Commission, and it's had to set up an assistance unit uh, to deal with issues of child abduction and forced marriage, uh, and data in 2016 revealed there were 612 cases uh, of the latter um, involving uh, girls from Britain uh, being taken back to uh, Pakistan and married against uh, their will. This is, of course, forced marriage is very different to uh, arranged marriage, which says consent. This concern uh, for Britons within Pakistan, of course, is a new twist to a long-standing um, role which the High Commission, uh, along with, of course, uh, overseas missions generally, uh, plays in, in the sense of protecting um, citizens of their country in uh, a number of ways. The High Commission, of course, was involved in this almost from the beginning uh, in the uh, help it gave uh, for the evacuation from Srinagar uh, in uh, October 1947 of Britons in the wake of the tribal invasion, right at the beginning uh, of, of the, uh, the Kashmir issue. The High Commission was also engaged in uh, large-scale evacuation of Britons in 1965 and 1971. Uh, in the context uh, of, of war uh, between uh, India and Pakistan. The book concludes with a chapter on the decade, uh, which I've called one of crisis between 1998 and 2008, uh, uh, involved, involving such issues, of course, uh, as uh, the Indian and Pakistan nuclear tests, the 2001-2 standoff between India and Pakistan, the threat of war following the November 2008, uh, Mumbai bombings, and, and of course overhanging all of this, the aftermath of 9-11 uh, for the whole of, of the region, including of course Afghanistan. Uh, the High Commission uh, itself in this period, of course, faced threats leading to uh, no child policy, securitization. At times it, it had to be reduced to a skeleton staff, at other times, uh, it was the largest um, British diplomatic mission internationally. So uh, there was a real roller coaster uh, of uh, influences in this decade. However, the decade, uh, despite its drama, saw a continuation uh, of some of the earlier trends which the volume looks at, uh, the trends of uh, Anglo-American cooperation, uh, the quiet diplomacy, uh, of personal influence uh, and also, of course, the need for uh, decisive leadership at the head of the mission at moments uh, of crisis. Uh, the vantage point of the High Commission also enables uh, a fresh light to be shed on some aspects of Pakistan's diplomatic, uh, domestic history, I should say, uh, during uh, this period. Uh, the volume sort of concludes uh, with uh, venturing the argument that Britain has displayed throughout these seven decades uh, what might be termed a diplomacy of influence and friendship in Pakistan. Uh, Pakistan, of course, um, is a country in which, uh, in order to work the system to secure influence, uh, you do need uh, to utilize personal connections alongside formal structures. Uh, and, and I'm arguing the most successful British diplomats uh, serving in Pakistan uh, displayed interpersonal skills, which emphasize trust and mutual obligation. Uh, of course, the art of diplomacy always calls for such abilities. 
but I think uh, an argument can be made that they are at a premium uh, in, in Pakistan. Whilst you might term the, um, the, the British uh, diplomacy then uh, one of uh, influence and friendship, you could contrast this, as, which I do, certainly in the conclusion, with what I might call a more transactional American uh, approach uh, to diplomacy. Uh, Americans have always had more resources to bear uh, in terms of um, Pakistan than Britain. Uh, but uh, despite pouring in billions of dollars, uh, it, it's often infuriated uh, American opinion that they received only grudging acceptance. Uh, Britain's stock, uh, although Britain cannot provide the same kind of uh, resource allocations, has frequently been higher. And uh, I would say that, that this is based on uh, this diplomacy of influence and uh, other ways in which uh, what might be termed soft power uh, is, is deployed. And here, of course, uh, you can't look at the, the work of the High Commission in isolation from other organizations, uh, the work of the BBC uh, in uh, uh, Pakistan, but also the, uh, the work of the British Council. And indeed, uh, British Council libraries uh, for decades have been very important interfaces uh, between a reading Pakistan uh, public uh, and Britain. Right, I'm going to finish on that point uh, and uh, open it up for uh, reflection from uh, others. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank, thank you, Professor Stockwell. I, I presume you're calling upon me to, to make my interjection. Um, I'm afraid, uh, Professor Stockwell, you're muted. Hi, Tony. If you go to the bottom left, there should be um, an unmute button. I think I'm all right there now. Yes. Lovely. Apologies. Over, uh, back to you, Rakesh. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. I, I should like to begin by thanking Professor Stockwell and congratulating Professor Tolbert on, um, on a very fine book whose glimpse he has, he has just given you. Uh, this um, three-part, nine chapters, covering roughly 60 years book, is one of great detail. Wonderful set pieces, great episodes of war and peace, personas, events. I learned a lot as I read it, and I enjoyed not a little. And to my mind, the book stands at the cusp of three circles, as it were, or three domains or arenas. And so without um, any further introductory ado, and without taking a lot of your time, hopefully, I should like to introduce these three arenas or, the, or, or these three domains in which I thought that the book is best contextualized, best situated and read, and not only does it do justice to these, but it also opens up further avenues for research. To begin with, the book starts to illuminate an afterlife of empire in that region of uh, post-colonial states of India, Pakistan, and uh, let's not forget Bangladesh, which um, celebrates its 50th year of existence this year but is very much a part of this story in the early chapters of the book. That region which saw not just a hangover of colonial states, but very much an embedded entrenched structures of colonial legacies. Naturally, a book of this kind, 
um, seeks to use some of those generational, systematic, institutional, and other similar entry points into talking about a region which, to put it very simply, is one of uh, great demand and great discussion at this time. Just the sheer size of the Indian subcontinent, the scale of population, questions of global market, immigration, and so forth, mean that all books on India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Afghanistan, Burma, Sri Lanka, that region are very welcome. And so to my mind, this book's first contribution is to trace that arc of the long shadow of empire into the commonwealth years. And again, before we, it's, it's best to remind ourselves what a, what a tortuous time Pakistan has had in the commonwealth, even though it was India whose entry into the commonwealth was of much debate and discussion given that it opted to be a republic. And yet it was Pakistan just had, which has had ups and downs in its commonwealth experience. So this intermingling of these nations in a large subcontinental region, which continued in a colonial state apparatus, allows us to understand and situate this book and use some of its details and insights for that kind of an instructive story. A glimpse into the society, elite establishment society in the early chapters, but also the diasporic and other uh, sections of the Pakistani society in its later chapters. That to my mind is the first setup. The second, of course, is that this is an institutional history. This is an institutional history. The institution at heart is the British High Commission and its outposts. Now, embassies and high commissions are understood as great sites, as great spaces, as great agents. Um, in this case, um, as Professor Talbot mentioned, the British establishment in Pakistan started from scratch, unlike in next door India. So did the British outposts. Therefore, to that greater extent, the anecdotal and life history and published memoirs of some of those early personalities, including uh, the, the women's presence in the High Commission is of such interest to us. The book brings to us the social and political life of the High Commission as it were, quite apart from furthering British interests. Now, in this trajectory of this institutional history, we can talk about the set piece episodes of 1965 and 1950. We can talk about 1971 and 1979. And we can, we can, we can bring this story into our own times, depending on how we would like to dip into this, this, um, this story in continuum. And this, to me, is a great strength of this book. Um, whether it is the digital diplomatic side of it, whether it is the presence of Pakistan in the global British aid and other interventions, whether it is Cold War competition. Depending on one's interest, this institutional history affords a glimpse which illuminates some of these sections. One can think of similar accounts of embassies and crises, whether it is the Arab-Israel war, or one, or one can think of the American embassy in Vietnam through those 20 years as affording an entry point into a particular kind of intergovernmental, interrelational stories. Which brings me to my final point. This is a very fine book, which also stands at the cusp of contemporary history writing. And with respect to interdisciplinary contemporary history writing, uh, whether it is international relations done in a more archival manner, or whether it is diplomatic history, which is done in a more thematic sense, be it that of embedded history, or um, any of the other various theoretical interventions. I think, if I may channel some Dickens, it is the best of times to write history in South Asia, but it is also the worst of times to write history in South Asia. It's the best of times because there is a widening of archival resource base. There is great infusion of different methods of oral history, of interviews, of newspapers, increasing access in the subcontinent itself to write about those fascinating societies beyond uh, their usual tropes of religion or violence or terror. Uh, we, can, we, can, we can open up some of these fronts of how to write contemporary history of these regions, these, these nation states, uh, using, using some of the insights of this book of contemporary, international, interdisciplinary, diplomatic interventions. Now, empires moved people 
And so very fittingly, this book, which begins with the end of empire in Pakistan, uh, concludes with the diasporic Pakistani population, not least in this country, uh, wherein some of the everyday paperwork challenges, not only the high politics of symmetry or otherwise diplomatic army or democratic establishments, aid or market functions, but everyday challenges, and Professor Talbot uh, hinted to you some of the social and cultural questions that he touches upon. So all in all, a book by a scholar who has studied and associated himself with this region for a good three and a half, four decades now, and ties these threads together in a, in a very fascinating manner, which throws lights on the UK interests, and primarily from that vantage, it also brings to us a rich tapestry of other related, not least hyphenated stories vis-a-vis -vis India, Bangladesh, and the United States of America. With that, thank you. Thank you, Rakesh. Ian, do you want to respond at this juncture? I, I think I'll just um, make a couple of points. Um, certainly, the work evolved uh, in a slightly different way than I am originally anticipated it. But I, I, I agree with what Rakesh is saying in, in that uh, this is a way of tying together lots of different uh, approaches to uh, contemporary South Asia and particularly contemporary Pakistan uh, and, and through the prism uh, of, of the High Commission. So it's, it's not just a, an institutional history, but it, it's also international relations, it, it looks at some of the social and cultural issues, and it's very much uh, anchored in the latter stages in the, uh, the diasporic uh, context, uh, which has uh, impacted uh, on, on the work uh, of, of the High Commission. So it's, it's both a worm's eye view and an eagle eye view, if you can have this two things in the same uh, volume. Thank you. Uh, Roger, Roger Long, I, are you are you in a position to to come in at this juncture? Certainly, yes. If you can hear me, okay. I can. I hope others can too. Right. Right. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I want to begin by saying thank you to the Royal Asiatic Society first of all for putting on this uh, event. Uh, one of the silver lining of this terrible period we're living through is the fact that we have more and more events like this. So. Uh, thank you to the you. society for uh, for doing this. Secondly, I want to thank uh, Rutledge Press, uh, especially Dorothy Ashepta uh, and now Alexander uh, for uh, making Rutledge Press uh, such a valuable um, uh, source for books on Pakistan studies and South Asian studies. Uh, we're exceedingly grateful to Rutledge too uh, in this very difficult time for their continuing publication of materials on South Asia. Uh, so th those things. And finally, of course, thanks to uh, Ian. Uh, Professor Talbot, as, uh, as we know, uh, has been publishing for a long time. Uh, his first publication on the subject came out in 1980. Therefore, for 41 years, he has uh, been uh, contributing to our knowledge and our understanding and our appreciation of Pakistan studies. So uh, thank you to him for that and uh, may he long uh, continue. Um, I'm going to raise just two or three issues uh, so that uh, other people can join in and perhaps we can uh, put Ian on the hot seat, uh, if not on the, in the electric chair, uh, but certainly he can uh, answer these uh, questions himself. The manuscript uh, as has been mentioned, is very rich, it's full of details, uh, it offers a great deal of food for thought, uh, and uh, we very much uh, appreciate that. Uh, and um, raises many issues uh, and offers uh, uh, many ideas. Um, I would, he has mentioned uh, so somewhat at length, so there's perhaps no need uh, to go into this too much but he has mentioned the difference between the US uh, and the UK diplomatic approach uh, and the remarkable amount of uh, knowledge that British diplomats brought to this, uh, brought to this uh, subject. I wonder what more uh, could be said at this stage 
uh, without go reading the book for um, ourselves. But one of the questions which uh, arises uh, from this uh, book is, what insights does this give us about Pakistan and the early history of uh, Pakistan? Uh, you know, in 1947, there were jokes being made about how Pakistan would collapse uh, like a tent, but within uh, three or four years, nobody was talking in, in that way. Uh, and uh, uh, Ian has mentioned uh, the different uh, perspectives which uh, the British uh, had. Uh, I wonder um, what, uh, by looking at these diplomatic uh, materials, what this tells us about Pakistan's history uh, and how this uh, changes. Uh, and um, overlapping all of Pakistan's history is, of course, Mountbatten uh, and uh, the special role that he played in the creation of Pakistan, uh, the creation of the Kashmir uh, issue. Uh, I was wondering, uh, especially in view of his and Professor Wulga, who I believe is, is here, uh, they are the University of Southampton, because of its proximity to Mountbatten's uh, mansion, uh, Broadlands, is the holder of the Mountbatten papers. So I was wondering what Ian could tell us about um, Mountbatten whether his interest in South Asia continued. Uh, obviously, he is held in different regards in India and Pakistan, uh, but I was wondering what the diplomatic uh, records tell us uh, about uh, Manhattan, about Mountbatten. There are many other questions which we could ask, but I think that given the time we have left, uh, we should uh, uh, ask him to comment on these things and, and allow other people to come in with their, with their comments. But this is another fascinating uh, book uh, by Ian, by my count, his uh, 16th book. Uh, and we are grateful to him uh, for his uh, contribution to the studies. And thank you, Tony, for these comments. Roger, thank you very much indeed. Um, Ian, would you like to respond at this juncture with regard to that specific question, the role of Mountbatten? Yes, the role of Mountbatten. I, I mean, Mountbatten um, did not uh, cease his interest uh, in South Asia in 1948 uh, when he returned uh, to the UK uh, from being uh, the first Governor General uh, of India. That period of his gov governor generalship, it, interestingly, I, I think is often uh, colours, uh, along with controversial issues like the boundary, uh, how he's viewed in Pakistan. And whilst he maintained uh, a, a, an interest in uh, South Asia generally, he visited India, not Pakistan, uh, after independence. The, the records, uh, and, and actually, uh, Rakesh has used these when he was at uh, the University of Southampton, indicate that at crucial moments, uh, Mountbatten uh, both influenced Nehru, uh, who he had close relationship with down to Nehru's death, uh, and he also uh, was, I think, used by the British to um, give them an insight into what was happening from his perspective. Uh, in India. So he was certainly very much involved uh, at the end in that episode I referred to in my introduction, the, the efforts uh, to try and resolve the Kashmir dispute uh, in 1962-3. In uh, Mountbatten was one of the big guns that was rolled out it was, uh, in the hope that uh, this could, could move things at, at that time. Mountbatten was also involved uh, earlier uh, in terms of uh, Hyderabad, uh, and, and he was also uh, uh, frequently uh, a host of Nehru at Broadlands. Uh, whenever Nehru attended a Commonwealth uh, Prime Minister's Conference, he would tend to spend uh, a day or two at Broadlands uh, when he was visiting the UK. So the relationship continued. Uh, and, and as part of this um, 
this continuing uh, influence, which I think uh, Britain has in both India and in Pakistan, uh, very much uh, down to the mid 1960s and beyond, uh, even after Nehru's uh, death, Mountbatten was still uh, uh, involved and interested uh, in India. Uh, but obviously, he didn't have the same uh, impact, uh, perhaps, uh, that he'd had uh, in the Nehruvian era. So this is uh, all part, I think, of seeing 1947 independence and partition, uh, sometimes called the Great Divide, but it's also uh, important to see continuities uh, as well as discontinuities. And, and these are around figures uh, like uh, Mountbatten. Mountbatten certainly had um, a closer uh, impact in terms of the the higher reaches of government than any of the high commissioners did in Pakistan, in India, um, and, as indeed did um, Nai, who was the deputy uh, high commissioner in Delhi for a while. Um, the, the British influence uh, was through the military sometimes, was through um, the um, con connections with how politics operated to get things done, rather than right at the top level. Uh, of, of uh, the, the administration. Uh, that's something which I, I think uh, if you wanted to have a future comparative study uh, of British diplomacy in India and Pakistan in this post-colonial period, it would be interesting to see the work of the two high commissions side by side and, and the differences as well as the similarities. So uh, to answer Roger's question, yes, Mount Batten is a, a continuing uh, figure of some influence uh, after 1948, down to 1964 and beyond. Thank you very much indeed, Ian. Um, Alison, have we been collecting questions from the floor? Yes, we do. We have a, a couple of questions. Uh, the first one is, um, did the increase in immigration applications from Pakistan in the 70s and 80s distort the wider objectives of the High Commission in promoting British-Pakistan relations. Uh, British, this is a comment, British diplomats, especially those administering immigration, found it difficult to socialize with Pakistanis because they expected to be lobbied about the applications they were dealing with. So they made few, if any, friends. So that's, that's the first question. And there's, there is another one that's just come in, which I will go to in a minute, but perhaps you'd like to respond to, to this. Yes, I mean, I think that um, immigration could be very much an area where the High Commission and Britain could come in for criticism uh, in terms of uh, how uh, these applications were dealt with by the, uh, from within Pakistan, and, and it was a sensitive issue uh, for, for that reason. It certainly was something which emerged with the passage of time, as the uh, British Pakistani community grew uh, in uh, numbers and in wealth uh, within the, the UK itself. Also, of course, um, what's happening in terms of how that community is treated in Britain can impact on Britain's standing within Pakistan. So it, it's not just dealing with uh, the, the, the consular activities, but there's also um, a public relations element uh, to this. So the claims of Islamophobia uh, and issues around that become something which the High Commission has to both provide information for, uh, for London's uh, use, but, but also has to deflect uh, within Pakistan itself. So the diasporic dimension complicates uh, the activities of the High Commission, but of course it also provides opportunities uh, perhaps for uh, advancing commercial interests or uh, it could also offer opportunities for advancing uh, Britain's standing. Uh, people like Amir Khan in, in recent times have been held up as models of success within British society. There's always the, uh, the opportunity to, to talk about um, successful Pakistanis in Britain 
uh, and for that to be uh, an element uh, in uh, Britain's reputation uh, within Pakistan itself. So it's a complicated um, element, uh, but it can bring opportunities as well as uh, challenges. Um, right, thank you. We have a, another question. Um, in considering uh, the relationship of the United Kingdom with India and Pakistan, um, which do you consider closer to British uh, foreign policy interests? I think that, I mean, the stereotypical answer to that would be that, that um, Pakistan has been uh, of more significance in terms of strategic interest. India has always seen potentially uh, as more important for commercial economic interests. Uh, and, and that reflects, of course, um, the different economies and sizes of, of the two post-colonial states. Uh, that stereotypical portrayal, of course, would, would need to be nuanced, uh, and things are not quite as straightforward as that. Britain is not just interested in Pakistan for uh, strategic uh, reasons, uh, but there were, uh, particularly before uh, the breakup of Pakistan, uh, considerable British interest. We haven't really spoken about East Bengal much, uh, modern day Bangladesh. Uh, Britain had uh, considerable interest in um, the jute trade, uh, Britain had interest in terms of tea plantations uh, in uh, East uh, Bengal as well. So there were commercial interests there from the outset. It wasn't just all about uh, strategic uh, concerns as far as um, Pakistan uh, went. Uh, in, in relation to India and Pakistan, of course, Britain has to walk this tightrope, uh, you know, in, in terms of um, not showing favour to one or the other. And by walking the tightrope, uh, often it disappoints one side or the other because they feel that um, their interests haven't been uh, given the, uh, the, the weightage that uh, they would wish. So this is where... Uh, having both of these countries in the Commonwealth for, for much of this period, having this historic tie with both countries um, gives many, many advantages, but it also uh, can lead to difficulties in terms of this uh, needing to balance uh, the two. And, and always when there's a, a visit of a prime minister uh, to, to one country, there has to be they have to take in the other country as well, because that will send out the message if they don't, uh, that they value one over the other. Uh, that, that there's always this uh, a need then to, to try and show as far as possible uh, an even-handed approach. Thank you, Ian. Um, we have one more, have we got time for one more question, Tony? Or we, I'm sure we have, oh, yes. Several, actually. <laughs> So we'll just see. Um, we, 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 we're just, we've only done an hour, so uh, let it roll, let it roll. Well, there are just a, uh, as well, there's about three, three more, really. Um, okay. And what was the relationship uh, with, well, it says with the guys, but with uh, the Department uh, for International Development? Okay, I mean, the, the Department for International Development uh, greatly expanded its activities uh, in, in Pakistan in the, um, the first decade of um, the century, to the extent that a new building had to be put up for it uh, at, at, the, um, at the High Commission. And certainly uh, Pakistan uh, became a major recipient uh, of overseas aid. Uh, in this period of time. And this was especially, of course, aid that was uh, strategically um, given in order to try and encourage stability within Pakistan. Uh, and it was also very much directed around uh, government agenda in, in Britain in terms of trying to encourage gender equality, um, uh, education, uh, generally, much, most of this aid went into education. A lot of it uh, uh, was directed uh, to the least developed uh, tribal areas uh, at times. But Punjab itself, uh, because of the uh, system of, of governance and the connections which uh, the British had, was also a major focus 
uh, of, of the aid uh, activities and efforts. So very, it's very important, uh, I, I think, DFID's role and the, the close um, working of um, diplomacy and development uh, in Pakistan, I, I, I think is, is something which hasn't always been uh, fully acknowledged. And certainly when I was visiting the, the High Commission back in 2015, that, came, that point came across to me uh, very powerfully, uh, how, the, how these two arms, if you like, of British influence were working side by side uh, to, to try and bring about change for the better in Pakistan. I think these questions are coming rolling in and they're fascinating questions too. Alison, have you got some more? Yes, I have. Um, this is another one. Is Britain's colonial past both its strength and weakness? There was familiarity which future high commissioners could build on, but especially in the present day, past association is now associated with imperialism. I, I mean, I think that um, there are strengths and there are weaknesses, obviously, in this imperial legacy. Um, anyone who visits Pakistan uh, is struck, though, by, uh, and I think this is uh, quite clear, that within Pakistan, there isn't uh, an anti-imperial uh, narrative uh, as such. In part, perhaps, because Britain is seen as help, helping to, to, to bring to birth uh, Pakistan, despite all the controversies about division of assets and, and boundaries, that there isn't a, a, ever, I've experienced, a sense of a great resentment uh, of, of the British uh, presence uh, in Pakistan. That doesn't mean to say that there hasn't been criticised in terms of the way which, say, British rule bolstered uh, the more feudal elements within Pakistan society and that this had an impact on uh, future democratization in the country. Uh, but I don't think that there's a narrative uh, within Pakistan, at least not at the moment, uh, of uh, wanting to um, see Britain uh, in a very negative light because of its imperial past uh, in the region. Um, and thank you. And we have um, uh, another one. Um, could you comment on any particular challenges in carrying out your research? Challenges in doing the research? Um, I mean, one of the challenges, obviously, is if you're covering uh, a long span of time, you want to get balance uh, between all of these periods. And the, the documentary records tend to peter out uh, in the 1980s. And that was a, uh, an issue about how could I write uh, the more contemporary chapters in a way that gave the same uh, depth uh, of, of uh, analysis uh, and data uh, to this very rich uh, earlier period of, of, of documentary uh, material. And of course, that leads inevitably to uh, the need for um, interview material. Uh, it, it leads for perhaps the use of grey uh, gray literature, as it's called, uh, sometimes uh, obviously uh, looking at uh, events through uh, press reportage, but that has its own uh, limitations as well. So linking these uh, resource, resource, resource rich uh, earlier periods with the modern period, I think, was, was probably the contemporary period, I think was probably the, the, the main uh, challenge. Having said that, I mean, I thoroughly enjoyed, I really thoroughly enjoyed doing the research uh, for this, this work. It was great fun. It's frustrating at times, but great fun as well. And uh, I think that the challenges which came along the way uh, were. Um, in some senses, able to be turned to opportunities. We have a, another one which is asking about the role of British diplomacy during the evolution of East Pakistan into Bangladesh. Yes, I mean, this is an interesting uh, question because, of course, 
here it's very much a case that um, London, in the context of a news blackout, uh, is very reliant uh, on the reporting of, of the, uh, the Deputy High Commission in Dhaka uh, for, for what's going on. Uh, but within um, East Pakistan itself, um, there are, of course, variations in what's happening. Uh, the story, the narrative uh, from Chittagong is different to the narrative from Dhaka in terms of who are the aggressors. Who, uh, and uh, the High Commission uh, had to send in um, as balanced an account of what was actually happening as it was able to access in very difficult circumstances. Uh, and and that, that was one of its roles, at the same time as having to organize uh, evacuation plans uh, for, um, for Britons within uh, East Pakistan. It was having to respond to criticisms uh, that were coming from the Pakistan government about the, uh, the bias as they saw it at the BBC and, repress, and press reporting in terms of how the civil war, how the breakdown in the East uh, Bengal uh, was being received. And of course, this was also the first occasion uh, when uh, this emerging diaspora it, uh, plays a role in, in Britain because, of course, uh, activists, many of whom were Bengali nationalists, uh, uh, were um, sort of creating, uh, from the Pakistan government's point of view, um, an atmosphere in Britain uh, which, which was biased. So the High Commission has all of these pressures to deal with, plus one more that comes in is, is that um, the Nixon administration very much is tilting uh, towards Pakistan uh, at this time. Uh, and that uh, complicates um, relationships with uh, US di diplomats uh, in, in Pakistan, where Britain is trying to have more uh, of, of, a, of a balanced approach. Though ultimately the tilt is, is towards India, which of course is what um, led Bhutto after uh, 1971 to want to take um, Pakistan out of the Commonwealth. The rolling stone of questions is gathering more and more of them. <laughs> how, how are we doing? <laughs> One thing I think is, 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 is uh, true, we don't have, to, we're not looking at our watches because we have to catch a train. Uh, and of course, in the, if times were normal, we would be relieving our speaker uh, of the formal side and plying him with wine and we'd all be having a jolly time at the society. But as we don't have to move from our chairs, can we afford to have a few more questions? Yeah. Are you all right for that, Ian? Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm happy with that. Um, right. I, 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 would, I will raise my glass of water while I'm sort of answering. <laughs> um, right, we have, we have another one. Uh, how did the UK react to Pakistan and India's joint claims on the Indian office? Uh, library in the in 1950. I, I, I mean, this is again one of these hangovers of um, empire that um, has to be addressed. And I think that um, again, it, it's throughout all of this, it's, it's trying to have an even-handed approach. This is the key, really. And yet, um, if you're going to have an even-handed approach, you're going to disappoint. Uh, and that's the downside of this uh, colonial legacy, which is which is there. The records um, are, you know, of the High Commission. Perhaps I should say something about about those um, at the India Office uh, and also at the National Archives uh, are a major source which historians have deployed. Uh, in the past. Uh, a growing area, I think, is private papers of, of people with um, not just papers like the Mountbatten papers, but uh, papers certainly at the Cambridge uh, Centre for uh, South Asian Studies of, of former diplomats. The, these are uh, something which historians have been able to, to utilise uh, as well. Uh, 
within India and within Pakistan, of course, there are also records which um, uh, have uh, the possibility of shedding light. I mean, I know that um, Roger has used um, records in the cabinet division uh, in Pakistan, particularly reflecting on the early uh, Liaquat Ali Khan period. So there's a big um, source of material, yet everything is contested. There's an Indian and a Pakistani side of most issues. And, and that is a feature over records, who holds them, how the records go in terms of their interpretations. Right, uh, thank you. Um, we have another one. In military areas, can we say that the preeminent British tradition in Pakistan was overtaken by its American counterpart in the late 1950s and onwards? Yes, I mean, um, certainly 1954 is, is a, a, an important uh, date in terms of this American uh, increased influence uh, in, because of the uh, involvement of Pakistan from that time in the uh, anti-Soviet Cold War alliances and Pakistan being uh, a formal ally of the United States in that. Um, the competition between Britain and the United States is of course to, to sell arms, to uh, make sure that the, their technicians are um, deployed, also uh, the competition between them uh, for influence with the military and of course the Pentagon has always established close ties with the, uh, the Pakistan military. So this is an area of competition uh, between uh, Britain and the United States. The important thing to bear in mind of course is the United States can bring far more um, to the table for um, Pakistan. Pakistan can be provided with the things it needs by the United States rather than by Britain. That doesn't mean to say, of course, that um, links cannot be maintained with the Pakistan military through um, training uh, in Britain uh, and, and that um, people like Zia and Musharraf are well known in Britain uh, because of this uh, legacy. So that um, there is competition, uh, but Britain isn't able to provide the, the hard material that the United States uh, certainly can provide from the late 1950s onwards. Thank you. And uh, we have a, another question now, um, which is, uh, do the British uh, missions have relations with the inter-services intelligence agency, <laughs> even unofficially? <laughs> I'm not sure I can answer that question. I don't have the knowledge to answer it. Um, I mean, obviously, the, the High Commission uh, has to reach out uh, to all actors within Pakistan, uh, civilian and military. Uh, and uh, you know, there are accounts going back to the 1950s of visits of High Commissioners uh, to uh, the Pakistan uh, General Headquarters. So that um, this reaching out would be part and parcel uh, of uh, the normal mode of things. Certainly during the, um, the post um, sort of 2005 period, there, there was close work between MI6 uh, and uh, ISI in terms of foiling terror plots. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean to say that the High Commissioner was personally involved in uh, these uh, negotiations, but um, the expansion of, of the High Commission uh, in that period of time, which I think I referred to, was very much a feature uh, of the military security uh, part of the relationship uh, between uh, Britain uh, and, and Pakistan. Ian, thank you. Perhaps, uh, have you the stamina for one more question? And yes, one more, that will be fine, yes. <laughs> on the spot. Uh, lucky dear Alison, choose okay, one. Well, I'll, I'll go with the next one because how has the study changed your reflections on the study of Pakistan and the Punjab? I think that um, 
it hasn't dramatically changed it. I, I think what has been interesting to come out of the, uh, the, the study is both the, um, the reach of, of British influence, but also the limitations of it. Uh, because of course, Pakistan history, as you probably are all aware, you know, it can have a, a, a tendency towards conspiracy theories, that uh, everything that happens is, is because of someone pulling the strings, whether it's the military or whether it's um, the Americans or the British as their junior partners doing that. Certainly at key moments of time, uh, Britain and the United States has been very influential in what's happened uh, in, in Pakistan uh, domestic politics. Um, the return of Benazir Bhutto, uh, there's a lot of back channel uh, diplomacy going on, which I mentioned uh, in, in the final chapter uh, of, of, of the volume that uh, help to enable that but in key areas uh, Pakistan governments uh, were not uh, as you would expect them to uh, to be leveraged however influential uh, Britain or United States may be to do things which I don't think are in the national interest uh, and, and that uh, helps to explain why uh, efforts to resolve the Kashmir issue uh, have been ongoing and, and haven't uh, born fruit, uh, although both Britain and the United States have been active certainly since the 1950s in trying to, uh, to, to bring this about. So it's both the limitations of influence, uh, but also the, the continuing reach, I think, which uh, comes out. And, and all told, uh, I, I think um, it, it provides a, an understanding of, of how uh, this complex uh, relationship uh, operates and I think that that uh, has been the thing I've taken away really from the research I've done. Ian, thank you so much. It's been an absolutely fascinating evening. We, ha I, we hope you sell lots of copies and buy them from us because you get a discount. Uh, thank you the discussants, Roger and Rakesh. It's been tremendous to leading off in different directions and you as an audience have been brilliant. Stay in touch with us. Uh, there's an another uh, lecture two days uh, in two days time on um, acquiring books in 18th century Bengal, the William Jones Library. Definitely a must for a clientele such as ours. Thank you all and I don't have to wish you a safe journey back, but see you again at the Society. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.